Well, good Monday morning, beautiful soul. You are watching Things I Learned on Sunday, and this is a special edition of Things I Learned on Sunday, the 52nd episode, or the podcast has now been a podcast and a show for an entire year. And so what I thought I would do, and I hope you enjoy it, I'm going to look at some of my favorite clips from different episodes that have happened over the last 52 weeks, and I'm going to discuss why I like these clips or why they're my favorite, and they're in random order spread out over the last 52 weeks, so I hope you enjoy this one-year celebration of the Telos podcast. So the reason that I've included this clip is because it's really the first time in the podcast, I believe, that I really talk about mental health and specifically some mental health challenges that I've had in my life. And the the wrestling and studying I have had to do to understand how God's word fits into this aspect of mental health in my life. And I hope it's something that if you've ever struggled with mental health issues, or even if you haven't, I hope that this clip is educational and insightful for you. I had never thought about this before, and it's something Doug mentioned in our class. I want to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to read verses 6 through 10. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. This is obviously Paul speaking, and he's speaking about suffering. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say or because of those surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. So you guys, I'm sure probably if you're in the Bible at all, know this idea of Paul having a thorn in his flesh. Paul having some kind of great discomfort or suffering that was really always there even though we don't know exactly what the suffering or the thorn was. A thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, I am strong. So, I mentioned earlier the book Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And by the way, with that caveat that you're always reading from the Word of God, I would recommend this book. One of the things that I think is really cool about this book is that what Viktor Frankl, who was a psychologist during World War II, and he was a Jew, he was rounded up, he was put into a concentration camp with everyone that he knew, Most of the people around him died. His wife died. What I find so interesting about this book is what kept him going was his desire to understand why one man would lose hope, lose meaning, wither away and die, while another man going through the exact same hardships in the exact same external circumstances could up here keep himself moving forward, give himself a strong enough meaning to survive. Now, Viktor Frankl's meaning was to be able to make it through this so that he could then share the experiences and why some men made it and why some men did not. And so when it got down to where he was a little over 100 pounds, And when it got down to where he had so little energy from this soup that they would get every night that he could barely move, while he didn't want to do anything, he could in his mind picture himself lecturing to these large universities and explaining what helped some men to make it and why some men died. And he thought this would be so valuable to humanity that he had to survive 
in believing that he would survive, believing he could get out and that he would get to have these lectures and he would have great meaning from this. Well, one of the things that you see throughout Scripture is you see the power of a relationship with God in these concentration camps. And again, this is a secular book, but you would see people that would have these impromptu worship services that would lift the spirits of these men when nothing else could. You would see someone trying to do good in service of being a creature of God for no other reason than that, and that compelled them to want to take care of others that were suffering just like they were suffering, but it gave them meaning. You would see men that whenever they were in isolation, they could not have a relationship with anyone else, that they grew in their relationship with their creator one-on-one, and that this relationship gave them divine power, gave them divine strength to be able to move forward. And that's just something that I think is so amazing about this book. And it goes back to my first point that you can read secular books and you can read the Bible in parallel and you can stack these books up to the standard of the word of God and see why they're true and see where they're true and see where things are clearly spiritual and are clearly right or see where things are clearly best. And so, Doug talking about 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and talking about Paul having this suffering and talking about Paul asking God three times to remove this. See, I think we think about Paul being like, I delight in my sufferings because they show the power of God. We sometimes forget that Paul was flesh and blood and, and he, he begged God. He prayed to God in three separate occasions to remove this suffering from him, and God wouldn't do this. And so the thing that I learned on Sunday was a simple point that that Doug made, and it was this, that we not only see suffering of Paul, but Timothy speaks directly about his suffering. We see the apostles suffering in different external situations, and here's the thing that I learned. Not once did any of the apostles, with their ability to do miracles, to have miraculous power, not once did any of them use that power to heal their own suffering. I don't know about you, but I had never thought about that. They healed the sufferings clearly of other people. Paul had miraculous power. He didn't heal his own suffering. He asked God to take it away. When God wouldn't take it away, he didn't say, I'm now going to take it upon myself. These men, they made the very conscious choice where you and I don't have the exact same choice for it to be taken away like that. But they made the choice to suffer, I'm assuming, for the same psychology that Paul had. That whenever I am suffering, that that suffering as Paul would say, is made perfect or God's power is made perfect through that suffering or through our weaknesses. Because when we suffer and there's nothing else that can take care of us, God can take care of us. And now we're talking about the inner game and now we're talking about the mental game. You know, I don't talk a lot about this, but I've been to some dark places in my life, and that's probably not really popular to say in Christianity because we want to show our strength or we want to show that, you know, we have great faith and that God, you know, keeps us from going to these places. Well, I I definitely have been over the years in my life. um, I, without going into great detail about family, it's very clear that there is depression and darkness in my family tree. And even more so than that, I believe there's some real chemical imbalances within my family. And so I kind of look at my darkness, the darkness that I've had or the depression that I've had at different times in my life as a bug in the software. You know, I just look at it like that. It's not my fault. It's just something that comes along with the bug in the software. Now, 
over the years, I can absolutely say from personal experience that me having to lean on God, that has definitely drawn me closer to God and made me a stronger Christian while I've suffered. And I am the last person to say that I do that perfectly. Sometimes when it should be the first thing I do, it's the last thing that I do. But when I finally get around to it and I lean on God, it has made me closer to him and it has made me a stronger Christian. And so I think of Paul's words here, but I also know that Paul didn't go sit in a corner. Paul was a man of action. So I think sometimes whenever people deal with depression or they deal with darkness in their lives, in the past, ministers, churches have said, just rely on God. And I think the word just there is very telling because they're saying, just do that. You don't need to do anything else. I believe that God blesses us with resourcefulness and in today's day and age, he's blessed us with resources. So rather than asking God to help you, like the man who was on the roof when there was a flood, he prayed that God would deliver him from the flood and a helicopter came and the guy said, don't worry about it. I've prayed to God. He's going to deliver me from this. And then a guy in a boat comes to get the guy and the guy says, don't worry about it. Like I've prayed to God and he will deliver me. And then the guy ends up drowning, not realizing that these were messengers of God. These were resources sent by God. Well, we have resources today. We have counseling, we have online videos, we have our friends, um, we have confessing our struggles to our brothers and sisters. There are things that we can do just like with the book reading, as long as they're in alignment with the word of God. He will give us resources and we have to use those resources as gifts and get the help we need, but underlying it all is relying on him to give us what we need. So if you're someone that's ever dealt with the dark night of the soul, if you're someone that's ever dealt with extreme darkness or depression, I'm not a doctor, I don't play one on the internet, but I'm certainly someone who has resources and I can give those to you. So please message me if this is something that you're currently dealing with. I won't just say, just lean on God. I will say, God has resources available to you. Your foundation is to rely on God and to use the resources that he has given us. But what I find is so interesting is that that suffering that you're going through, the darkness that you are going through, if you lean on God first in whatever you do, that suffering, the psychology here, the principle here, is that that, that will draw you closer to God in a way that really nothing else can. So when you suffer, lean on God, just like the apostles did when they had the miraculous power to take their own suffering away. So I started adding shorts to the podcast because I wanted to have a teaser at the very beginning of the show of the very best content of the podcast portion. And that was really neat for me because it allowed me to really look at what I thought was most insightful from what I had learned and hope that that translated to you. And so this specific short, the reason that I'm adding it is because during the pandemic, whenever church numbers were really down, I faced a fear that I had never really faced to this extent before, and that is a fear about the ministry that I was serving and what could happen to the ministry in the future. And because it's a muscle that I had never really had to flex, I'd really never had to work, this fear of a ministry possibly ending, it, it really scared me. And it took a while for me to learn to lean on God. And this short is just that crunched down version, a summary of the psychology that it took that I had to learn to understand, to let go and live for God even in this way. And so anyone out there who still has challenges that have arisen from the pandemic, you'll find this insightful. Hopefully you find it insightful anyway. 
Currently at this moment in history, there is a war that is happening between Russia and Ukraine. We are getting more involved. We're just coming through a pandemic, which created a great amount of fear. And we're worried about the future economy of our country. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generation there's something very powerful in understanding that the war that you're waging internally is the same war that thousands and thousands and thousands of Christians have waged before you. Remembering I have the inability to cast a new fear onto God helps remove isolation and that fosters confidence moving forward. I can't give you some big epiphany as to why I added this clip. I added this clip simply because I love my mother and father-in-law and I love my wife's side of the family. And this is us going out there and chopping wood. I had already given lessons on this concept of chopping wood and how that applies biblically. And so that's what I share here, but in vlog form. So it is getting to be that time of year again. For the past probably 20 years of my life, when it starts to get cold, when November and December rolls around, that means it is time to go to the farm and get out there and chop some wood. Now, I didn't grow up on a farm and I didn't grow up chopping wood. This is something that I had to learn along the way. And when Jolie and I were dating, I went to her parents' house and she said they would probably be chopping wood. And so like any guy having a girlfriend that he wants to impress, I have these visions in my head of chopping wood and just chopping through it like butter, chopping wood all day and just showing her family, you know, what work ethic I have and how strong I am. And so we get out there and I see her dad, who is 72 years young in this footage, by the way, both Robert and Joyce are 72. And I see him chopping through this wood and I see him chopping through it fairly easily. And I think to myself, how hard could this really be to chop wood? So then I grab an ax and I'm like, I am going to show him how to chop me some wood. So I start trying to chop the wood. I'm not able to do it. I am hitting this as hard as I can. I'm swinging it as high over my head as I can get. And I'm pounding these tree stumps and I am not able to bust through the stumps. Then in contrast, I would look over at Joe Lee's dad and her dad was able to bust through the stumps. No problem. Now I am pouring sweat. I'm exerting all the energy I can possibly exert and I cannot make this happen. I can bust through the stumps eventually, but I notice it's a lot harder for me. Well, one thing I didn't do that day because of my pride, because I didn't have the humility to ask, I didn't ask her dad why it was easier for him to be able to chop through these stumps. So somewhere down the road, I got enough wisdom, whatever it may be, to ask her dad how he was doing this. And he said, well, it's actually pretty simple. You think in order to bust through the tree stump, you want to hit right in the center of the stump. But you see the center of the stump, the core of that stump is the oldest part of the tree. And as it grows out, it reinforces the inner part of that stump, making it stronger. So you don't try to strike the center of the stump, you strike the outside of the stump. And so then after watching him, I tried to do this and I could not believe how much easier it was. You see, I could exert less energy and less force and still get through that stump because I had the path laid out before me as to what I should do. And others had come before me, another had come before me that had tried this before and had failed and failed and learned to succeed. And I feel like this is such a good metaphor for having mentorship in our lives, that there are those that have come before us. There are those that have gone through the things that we've been through. There are those that have tried to bust through the stumps of life 
and failed enough until they succeeded. And we can learn from those people, learning decades of experience in minutes or hours. You see, we're all going to go through challenges in life, what I would call the hard stumps of life. We're all going to have these hard stumps that we have to face. When they come, and they will, we will need Christian mentors that will help us bust through these stumps of life without causing unnecessary suffering. You see, that day that I kept trying to bust through the center of that stump, that was unnecessary suffering. In so much of life, we try to go alone. We don't look to those Christian examples who have a whole wealth of spiritual knowledge and wisdom, wealth in the form of suffering, and suffering producing perseverance and us getting to learn about that perseverance from those people. Instead of doing that, we go through life and we hit hard times and we have the unnecessary suffering that comes from not learning from those that are wiser than us. In humility, we either need to be in mentor relationships or we need to be actively seeking spiritual, strong, Christian mentor relationships because you can leapfrog in growth in contrast to trying to have that same spiritual growth without having those mentors in our lives. So the ultimate outcome, the ultimate hope of a life well lived where you always seek mentor guidance or wisdom whenever you go through the hard stumps of life is that what were once the hard stumps of life are easy to bust through. That you no longer have the old rudimentary tools of that old rusty ax that you had when you were young. That you have that spiritual wisdom stored up within you. And those stumps that used to be so challenging, you have all the tools you need to be able to bust through them. And you find that the challenges that you now have are larger and are more quality challenges that stretch you, that help you to become more, that process never stops. But the ones that used to get in your way and stop you, you go right through them. I think we're hanging it up for the day after getting load number four. So the next two clips are where life is more surprising and entertaining than fiction. And this first one is a clip of me having a Bible study with a young man and a pretty wild thing just happening out of the blue and then me talking about it. So here's that clip. Another crazy thing that happened to me. This was on Thursday. Okay. One of my students and I were doing a Bible study together at this new coffee house. It is at Glenstone and Kearney, I believe, or Chestnut. Glenstone and Chestnut. Anyway, it's called Echelon Coffee House, and it's a pretty cool little coffee house. We met there because it's close to where he lives, and we were doing this Bible study. It's the first in the Christianity 101 series. It's called The Authority of the Scripture. Scripture. And so we're going through this study. We're sitting on a couch there and there's a gentleman sitting on the other side with his headphones on and I get up to get me some more coffee. Whenever I come back, this gentleman is talking to Colton and, you know, I'm thinking what's going on here? Like we're doing a Bible study. Who is this guy? It's just it's sad, but it's kind of odd now of days whenever somebody talks to you and you know, it's almost seems like an interruption when it probably shouldn't be that way. But he's talking to Colton. So I come over and I just have a seat and I, I nod to this man and he's quoting scripture while talking to Colton almost perfectly. And he just has a very caring tone and in a nice sensibility about him. And so I just kind of sit here and listen to the conversation he's having with Colton. And he said that he had turned his headphone down when we had started our Bible study and was listening to the study we were doing. And so he was talking to Colton about the authority of scripture and how he doesn't have to understand it all at first. And, and I was impressed with this man. So whenever he stopped talking, I said, now I, I 
I am assuming, sir, that that you have some kind of a preaching background because of how eloquently you speak about the word of God. And he said, no, he said, I don't. He said, it's just something that I enjoy. It's something that I that I spend time on. And so then he went back to talking to Colton some more. And I just found this so fascinating that he spoke as eloquently as he did without having an education in or a profession in the word of God. So after about 10 minutes, even though the stuff that he was saying was great, I thought, okay, I want to be sensitive to Colton's time. And we were already running a little bit late. They were having a great conversation. Finally, there was a lull and this gentleman looked at me and I said, Hey, I just really appreciate your time. And I gave the guy a handshake. And then we went back to doing our study. So we studied and went through a couple more scriptures. And then this man got up and I noticed he was getting up and and looked like he was getting ready to leave. So I shook his hand one more time and he shook Colton's hand. He said, you're doing a great job, young man. And I thanked him and he headed towards the bathrooms. Now, I never saw that guy leave the coffee shop. And I thought to myself, who was that guy? Now, here's the part that I didn't mention earlier. I had thought this during the conversation we were having with him because something just did not seem quite to add up to me with how well he knew the word of God. And yet this was seemed like sort of he just seemed much more versed than most Christians that I know. So I asked him if I could take a picture and I took a picture with him and Colton, like a selfie. I'm going to put this on the screen here in just a moment. But when I took the picture, there was just white light where he was sitting. No, I'm totally kidding. But here's the picture of the man. And so this is the man who was sitting across from us. This is Colton talking to him. It was so cool to um, to get a photo. And I asked him, you know, could could I take a photo and could I use this photo and ask Colton the same thing? It was neat to get a photo of this exchange. And I wanted to put it here. And I'm just curious if anybody knows this guy. OK, um, I, I don't know him. Uh, and like I said, I never actually saw him leave the coffee shop, but it was such a cool experience. So like the previous clip, sometimes reality is more surprising than fiction. This was certainly the case here. We just walk up on this turtle and I included it, not just because it was an impromptu thing that happened that I got to document, but I'm including it because it reminded me of something very profound. And that's what I talk about during this clip. So Joe Lee and I, a few weeks ago, we got the opportunity to take a little vacation time and we went to Sanibel. Sanibel is probably our favorite little place on earth. It is a little island that's off the southwest, more west than south coast of Florida. And there's not really a whole lot to do there and that's why we love it. Basically, you've got good places to eat And then you have biking trails so you can run, you can bike, there's kayaking you can do, um, there's paddle boarding you can do, but it's just a great time for us to, to unwind, to reset and to relax and just have a lot of uninterrupted time together and to be present with each other. One of the things, probably the most exciting surprise that happened on this trip is we came across this turtle that I'm showing you now. This is a loggerhead sea tortoise, sea turtle. And this loggerhead turtle, we're just walking along the beach, just enjoying an evening stroll. When Jolie sees this turtle coming up, well, actually sees the tracks of a turtle, and this giant three and a half foot, four foot in diameter t- turtle that has come up on the beach. And you might notice in this footage, there's cameras from every different angle. That's because as we saw this, there was another family that summers in Sanibel that had been there for 42 years every summer. And they said they have never seen anything like this in 42 years. Normally these loggerhead tortoises will come up on the beach to lay eggs and they do it at night. They very rarely do it while it's still light out because there's predators. So this was an amazing experience. 
And I did some research on these turtles because I shot a video just specifically about this encounter. And I'll put a link to that in the description below this video if you want to see this kind of home movie of this. But I found out that loggerhead turtles, their babies will hatch and by the moonlight reflecting off of the waves, they see to go back to the ocean, to go to the ocean for the first time. And these baby loggerhead turtles, first of all, only one in a thousand will survive. And then out of these, or maybe it was one in a hundred, I'm gonna have to fact check that, I'll put it in the description. But after they leave, they will go thousands of miles away from where they were born. And when they reach adult maturity, they will find the exact same beach that they were hatched at anywhere in the world to lay their own eggs. And sometimes they travel thousands of miles in order to do this. There are all kinds of things in nature that are a reminder to me of the power and of the divine plan of God. You know, if I go for a walk and I'm surrounded by trees and woods, what you're seeing is God's creation in its natural form the way he created it. And seeing this turtle, it was a reminder that God creates order. And that even though these tiny little turtles go out to sea when they're still babies, they can make it back thousands of miles to the same beach to go through the same process. And this has been happening over and over again for thousands of years. It's pretty incredible. So I'm very passionate about the idea of passion, what the world has to say about it and what God's word has to say about it. And because I deal with it a lot in college ministry, I've really had to try to hone and refine my biblical belief system on this idea. And that's what I discuss here. And I have a lot to say about this idea of passion because what I have found over the years being a campus minister now for roughly a decade, that one of the greatest challenges that students will come to me with is not feeling like they have a passion for anything and not being sure what they are supposed to do with the rest of their life. And so through having these conversations, it has gotten me really clear that American cultural, the definition in American culture of passion is really very distorted and incorrect as to what the actual definition of passion is and the way that scripture talks about passion. So there's nine verses in the New International Version between Old and New Testament that use the word passion. Galatians 5, 24, it says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So it gives a negative connotation, like passions are negative or sinful or tempting things that pull us a certain way. So that's how we see generally passion being talked about between the Old and New Testament when the actual word is used. If you look at the Greek definition of the word for the word passion is pothema, pothema. And that definition is, I think you'll find this interesting, that which one suffers or has suffered. Now, remember, we're talking about the word passion, that which one suffers or has suffered externally, a suffering, misfortune, calamity, evil or affliction as of the suffering of Christ and as also the afflictions which Christians must undergo in behalf of the same cause which Christ patiently endured. And then the next definition of an inward state and affliction, passion, and then another definition, an enduring, undergoing suffering. So it's really interesting because we've, we've heard of the movie The Passion of the Christ and it's more referring to suffering and so we see this definition throughout scripture. Now, let me give you the English definition of passion. So the English definition from dictionary.com, it says any powerful or compelling emotion or feeling as love or hate. The main point that I want to make 
the definition today is amoral, okay? So passion is something that compels us, powerful compulsion, emotion that compels us, but it can be positive or negative, good or bad. So the emotion itself, the way we would say it in our vernacular today, is a moral. Now, I love what the author has to say from the book about passion. You've probably heard the saying, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. I don't know if that's always true and neither do I because it's not. I don't know if that's always true. Even the most heart heart lifting career has elements of boredom and drudgery, but a passion for your work does give you something significant. The ability to achieve many more results at a much higher level than you would be able to without it. Talent's not enough. Passion is a difference maker. Our leader's passion is even more valuable because it's contagious. A leader who shows passion passes it on to followers. Passionate leaders also tend to attract new followers who already share the same passion. And so passion builds until the team is eagerly pursuing their dream together. As a leader, the first question you must ask yourself is, do I have passion for what I'm doing? If not, then it might be time to reassess your current role and duties or maybe find a way to relight or stoke the fire within by spending time with people of passion. So the point that the author is trying to make is that sometimes when we think of passion, we hold it to this benchmark that if I'm going to do something, if there's drudgery, as he says, or if there's challenge, or if there's something about it we don't like, then that's not the thing we're passionate about and we need to move on. Even though we think that whenever it comes to us, we probably inherently know intuitively that that's just not true. Anything you do when there's labor involved, anything that you're going to add value in doing, there's going to be some struggle. There's going to be some challenge or everyone would be doing that thing. So if you look at Colossians chapter three and verse one, it says, since then you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Now, obviously the heart is just a pump that pumps blood. That's the, that's the vernacular. That's all it is. However, we have come so used to from scripture, looking at the heart as the area where emotion occurs. So we just know intuitively, we, we know by language that whenever we say something is of the heart, then that means that there's strong emotion attached to that thing. So this not only says we're to set our minds on things above, but we're also supposed to follow with our emotion on things from above. And then if you go a little bit further in the same scripture, Colossians 3 and verse 8, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Now, since we were talking about matters of the heart earlier, we're going to look at matters of the heart, matters of emotion in two different ways here. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Okay, so that's verse 8. Let's look at verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, and now you're going to see these matters of the heart, these emotions that are positive, close yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, and then it goes on to say, clothed in love. So here's the important point I want to make. When we use the word passion today, it's an amoral word. Right here, we are really given examples of passion being both positive and good or negative and sinful. It has positive and negative states of being. Our emotional states can be positive or negative when it comes to passion. And I think this is how culture has distorted passion over the years because today, that feeling, that emotion, it's really follow your passion. What really is being said there is do exactly what you want to do. Do exactly what feels good. Like you have to search and search and search for what feels good because you're worth it. And if something doesn't feel good, you don't do that. 
that's not at all what the Bible means when it talks about setting your hearts towards God. What that means is, is that you set yourself to be in an emotional state to where that state moves you towards God. This is the difference between the two definitions, the distorted, the incorrect version of passion and the version of passion that leads us towards God. So passion is only a positive state. And this is the first thing that I learned on Sunday. It's only a positive state when it is fueled by a relationship with God. So when that student comes to me, And they're asking me, okay, what should I do? I don't feel like I have a passion for anything. I'm not, there's nothing that when I go into it, I'm all in 100%. I say that really doesn't matter. What it comes down to is when you look at that thing that you could do, number one, and we didn't talk about this aspect of it, but number one, can you make progress? Can you grow? Can you add tools to your toolkit doing this thing? Because if you can do that, What that means is, is that you make progress, you become more, and because the church is you and others, the church becomes more. If everyone grows, if everyone makes progress within their field, if everybody sets their hearts and minds on things above while they do this, then they're going to use those abilities to make the church more. That's number one when it comes to passion. Is there something that excites you that you can use within the church? And can you see a direct path to growing if you get into this career? So number one, do you see a clear path to using this passion, to moving along in this field or career or job or labor? Do you see a clear path to serving God? That's number one. And then number two, do you see a clear path to growth? To making progress because if you're living for God just like we see about taking pride in your labor from the book of Ecclesiastes if you're living your life for God and if you're growing and if you're laboring and that is helping you to grow which is helping the church to grow and you're serving God that's something that we can be happy about that's something that will fulfill us is living that life for God. So that's the correct definition of passion if you've ever been concerned about finding your passion for something. And if it comes up empty and you've wondered why, if it comes up hollow and you've wondered why, it's because you're truly only going to be filled with the Spirit. That is it, my friend. Thank you so much for taking this trip with me down memory lane over the last year of the Telos podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast. Please click the little notification bell so you'll be notified of the spiritually nourishing content appearing weekly. And whatever you do, my friend, make it a great day today by serving and by allowing your bright light to be seen all week. And as the good book says... They will know we are Christians by our love. Until next time.